Hello everyone, and welcome to my channel. My name is Nick Malloy, and today I'm going to provide you with a demonstration of the tutorial, Musical Destination. In this activity, you'll be conducting a site suitability analysis for a music festival location. This demonstration is based on the written instructions provided to you in Canvas. Sometimes we update them, so you should always use the written instructions when following along with this video. Also, check Canvas for specific instructions on what you need to turn in at the end. Different instructors might have different requirements for this assignment. Okay, let's get started. Setting up your workspace. Begin by setting up your workspace. Start by creating your project folder on your computer's desktop. You can call the project folder Musical Destination. Be sure that there are no spaces in the name, as this can cause problems. You can use an underscore instead of a space. This course uses a standardized folder structure to help you keep your data organized. Inside the project folder, you should create three subfolders, original, working, and final. The original folder is for storing unaltered copies of your data. The working folder is either for working copies of your data or data sets you create during the project. The final folder is for storing your outputs, such as tables, reports, and final map layouts. Setting up a project in ArcGIS Pro. Next, you should launch ArcGIS Pro. If it's your first time working in ArcGIS Pro, you might be prompted to sign in. On the ArcGIS Pro homepage, click Map under the New Project Options. When the Create New Project window opens, name the project Musical Destination. It's fine to use spaces here. The next two steps are important, so don't skip them. Click the File Folder icon so that the location is set to your Musical Destinations folder on the desktop. Then, uncheck the box next to Create a New Folder for this project. The only time you would leave this box checked is if you started here and still needed to create a project folder. In this instance, you don't need to create a new project folder since you already did that earlier. When you create a project in ArcGIS Pro, several elements are added automatically to your workspace files. Open the project folder in Windows File Explorer to see what's inside. You should notice that beyond the three subfolders you initially created, original, working, and final, there are a few other items added to your workspace, such as a geodatabase and an ArcGIS project file. Never delete any of these folders and files from your workspace, or you run the chance of corrupting your project. In ArcGIS Pro, you can see the default files in the catalog pane by twirling open the folders. Downloading the project data. Now you need to download the project data. You can find direct links to these datasets in the written instructions. It tends to save to your downloads folder automatically. Also, some of the files are very large, so it may take a while to fully download. Once you have it, copy it from your downloads folder to your original folder. Next, use 7-zip to decompress the file. One shortcut I like to use is a right-click drag on the zip file, which brings up the 7-zip options. If you can't get that to work, then right-click and show more options to get to the 7-zip menu. Use the Extract Here option when it comes up. Once it's done decompressing, go ahead and delete the original zip file. In ArcGIS Pro, you may need to refresh the original folder to see the files. Updating the Spatial Reference System. For every analysis, it's important that each dataset you use shares the same spatial reference system. ArcGIS Pro makes it possible to view overlapping datasets with different spatial reference systems using Project on the Fly. However, this feature can hide spatial errors such as a datum shift. For a review on spatial errors and datum shifts, Check out my video on how to understand spatial errors in map datums and projections. To prevent unwanted spatial errors, 
you need to check each of the data sets provided for this project. Then you will use a project tool as needed to create new data sets with the desired spatial reference system. Since we are working with data located in Humboldt County, the spatial reference system we will use is NAD 1983 UTM Zone 10 North. Let's start by checking a data set that contains rivers in Humboldt County. In ArcGIS Pro, twirl open the original folder and right click on the data set that starts with the letters NHD. Then open the properties. When the properties window opens, check the spatial reference system. As you can see, this one is good. It is already using NAD 1983 UTM Zone 10 North. Go ahead and close the properties window. Since we know this data set is ready to go, you are going to import a copy of this data set into the Project GeoDatabase. Right click on the Musical Destination GeoDatabase and select Import, then Feature Class to GeoDatabase. When the Geoprocessing pane opens, add the NHD shapefile as the input feature. Leave all the other default settings and click Run. The NHD dataset gets added to the Project GeoDatabase. You may need to refresh it to see the file. Let's give this file a human-friendly name. Right-click on the NHD feature class and rename it Rivers. Next, drag and drop the Rivers feature class onto the map. Next, we'll repeat this process for the shapefiles containing the parcels for Humboldt County. In the catalog pane, open the layer properties for the shapefile starting with APN. Check the spatial reference information. As you can see, this data set uses a different spatial reference system. It's using the state plane system instead of the UTM system. To fix this, you'll need to use the project tool. Go ahead and close the layer properties. Click the Tools button on the Analysis ribbon to open the Geoprocessing pane. Type Project in the search box and open the Project tool. For the input dataset, browse to the original folder and select the shapefile that starts with APN. For the output, name the file Parcels. For the output coordinate system, Click the Select Coordinate System button. Here you can grab the UTM coordinate system from the Rivers layer. Twirl open the Layers group and select NAD 1983 UTM Zone 10 North. Leave all of the other settings and click Run. ArcGIS Pro automatically adds the new feature class to the map, and if you look at the Project Geo database, you should see it there as well. Skill Drill using the project tool. Repeat these steps for the remaining shapefiles, which are the California wetlands, the Humboldt County outline, the roads, which start with Humtrans, and the zones in Humboldt County, which starts with HumZ. You're going to open the properties for each of these files to check the spatial reference system. If you encounter a file that does not use NAD 1983 UTM Zone 10 North, then use the project tool and save the output to your geodatabase. Give the geodatabase feature classes human-friendly names such as Zones, Wetlands, Roads, and Humboldt County. When you are done, you should have six new feature classes in your geodatabase. Projecting Raster Data The original folder also contains a Landsat image of our area of interest. Open the properties for this file as well and check the spatial reference information. This one is a little tricky. At first glance, it may appear to have the correct spatial reference since it uses the UTM system. 
However, notice that the datum is WGS 1984, not NAD 1983. The difference in map datums can cause spatial errors. We need to use the project raster tool to correct this problem. The project tool only works on vector data. For this data set, you need to use the project raster tool. Click the tools button and type project raster. For the input raster, choose the JPEG file that starts with LC. For the output raster, name the file Landsat. Set the output coordinate system to NAD 1983 UTM Zone 10 North. You can use the layers group as a shortcut. Change the resampling technique to bilinear interpolation which produces a smoother result. Leave all the other settings and click Run. When it's done, the Landsat image gets added to the map. You should see the Landsat raster data set in the Project Geo database. Adding XY data. There is one more data set to prepare. It's a text file containing the latitude and longitude coordinates for cell towers. Take a moment to look inside this file. In Windows File Explorer, navigate to your original folder and open the cell tower text file in Notepad. As you can see, the contents of this file are pretty basic. Along the top are field names separated by a tab. You have the cell tower location number, the city, and the latitude and longitude coordinates. We refer to this type of data as XY data. Notice that there is no information regarding the map datum. ArcGIS Pro won't know that information, so we'll have to supply it ourselves. If you get it wrong, the points won't be in the correct location. To understand this, it's important to remember that each geodetic datum has a unique set of latitude and longitude values. For example, the latitude and longitude values for the clock tower at Cal Poly Humboldt using the World Geodetic Datum of 1984 will be different than the latitude and longitude values using the North American Datum of 1927. Likewise, the North American Datum of 1983 will use yet another set of latitude and longitude values to define the location of the clock tower. Because most XY data does not have any information about the map datum, the ArcGIS software can only read the coordinates. It's up to us to verify that the correct datum gets used. In this instance, these latitude and longitude coordinates come from a datum called the World Geodetic Datum of 1984, or WGS 1984 for short. This is the most commonly used geodetic datum for latitude and longitude coordinates that you would get from the web or from a GPS receiver. In this step, you're going to convert this XY dataset into a point feature. Let's go back to Arc Pro. In the catalog pane, right click the cell tower text file and choose export, then table to point feature class. Name the output cell tower with no spaces. The X field and the Y field are automatically populated with the latitude and longitude. Make sure the coordinate system is GCS WGS 1984. This is the original spatial reference for these latitude and longitude coordinates. Next, click the Environments tab. Here you're going to set the spatial reference for the output feature class. Set the output coordinate system to NAD. 1983, UTM Zone 10 North. When ready, click Run. The cell towers are added to the map. You should also see this feature class in your Project Geo database. Now that we have 
all of our data sets in the correct spatial reference system, we are ready to begin our analysis. Attribute query. Before starting any analysis, it's essential to first go over the criteria. This step is necessary to grasp the overarching goal. By examining the criteria, you'll get a clearer idea of which data to use, the appropriate timing for its use, and the specific spatial operations that are required. Consider the situation where you're tasked with finding a suitable location for a music festival. Your main goal here is to identify an appropriate piece of land for this event. Selecting just any location won't work. You'll need to apply specific criteria to narrow down your options. In this case, the land should be classified as rural residential. Additionally, it needs to be in areas of Humble County that are zoned as U or unclassified. A crucial requirement is that the music festival site should be adjacent to a road to ensure easy access for staff, emergency services, and attendees. There are also environmental considerations to take into account. The chosen property shouldn't have any rivers or streams passing through it, and it must be positioned at least 600 meters away from any wetland areas to protect these environments. The size of the property is another important factor. It needs to be large enough for the music festival with a minimum area of 70,000 square meters. Lastly, considering the importance of communication and safety, the site must be within range of a cell tower to ensure strong cell service in case of emergencies. The next step in the process will be to focus on the first criterion, which is identifying parcels that are categorized as rural residential. Let's start by clearing out any unnecessary layers from the contents pane. Don't skip this step. In this tutorial, you'll be creating many intermediate layers that you'll only use for a short time. The contents pane will get cluttered fast if you don't stay on top of it. This will slow down the software and potentially lead to mistakes. For this step, all you need is the parcels layer. I am also going to remove the default Esri base map. Most Esri base maps come with a reference layer, so you should remove that as well. In this exercise, you'll be creating your own base map using the Humboldt County boundary. You can leave that layer in the contents pane as well. Just be sure to place it below the parcels layer so that it doesn't cover it up. I'm also going to change the color of the Humboldt County layer so that I can tell it apart. Though it's not strictly necessary, you may want to do this as well if your parcel layer and the Humboldt County layer have the same color. Open the attribute table for the parcel layer. Take a moment to look at the attribute data. Under the field EXLU4, you'll see a number of land use categories. In this step, I'm going to use the EXLU4 field to select parcels with the land use category of Rural Residential. At the top of the attribute table, click Select by Attributes. The selection type should be set to New Selection. In the Expression group, create an expression that says where EXLU4 is equal to Rural Residential. You can use the drop down menu to locate the EXLU4 field. You can also use the drop down menu to define the operator. It is set to is equal by default, which is what you want for this query. Last, you're going to use the final drop down menu to select the attribute you want from the EXLU4 field. In this instance, you want to choose Rural Residential. Go ahead and click Apply to run the tool. Click OK to close the window. You should see two things happening. On the map, the parcels defined as rural residential get highlighted. In the attribute table, the corresponding records get highlighted as well. Click the Show Selected Records button to check how many parcels in Humboldt County are classified as rural residential. I can see that I have 
10,856 parcels that fall into this category. One of these parcels will be the location of the music festival. I just have to narrow it down a bit. Let's create a new feature class from this selection. Go ahead and close the attribute table. In the contents pane, right click on the parcel layer and choose data, then export features. Name the output feature class rural parcels. Be sure that there are no spaces in the name. You can use an underscore instead of a space. When ready, click OK. A new feature class gets added to the contents pane. Whenever you are done with the selection, it's important to get into the habit of clearing your selected features. Leaving features selected can have unintentional consequences. Click the Clear button in the selection group. Next, remove the original parcel layer from the contents pane, leaving just the rural parcels over the Humboldt County layer. Take a moment to save your project before moving on to the next step. Skill Drill Attribute to Query I have satisfied the first criterion. In the next step, I'm going to narrow down the range of properties further by finding out which of these properties are also areas of Humboldt County that are zoned as U, which stands for unclassified. From the Project Geo database, drag the zones feature class to the map. Then open the attribute table. You should see an attribute called U. Any zones that are unclassified will have a value of Y. Using the skills you just learned, perform an attribute query on the zones layer where U is equal to Y. Once you're done, you should have about 562 records selected. Close the attribute table and export the selected records as a new feature class. Call the new feature class UZones. When you're done, go ahead and clear your selection, then remove the original zone layer. I don't like that the colors are similar, so I'm going to change the U zone layer to pink so that I can tell the difference. I'm also going to remove the outlines to make the map look cleaner. Last, I'm just going to drag the U zones under the parcels layer so that I can see where they overlap. Now I have two layers, one with parcels that have the land use category of rural residential and one with zones in Humboldt County that are unclassified. In the next step, I will show you how to use the intersect tool to create a layer with only the overlapping areas. Using the intersect tool. When you run the intersect tool, only areas where the two layers overlap will be kept. Click the Tools button on the Analysis ribbon to open the Geoprocessing pane. In the search box, type Intersect and open the tool. For the input features, use the drop-down menu to select the U-Zone and Rural Parcel layers. Name the output feature class Rural U. Leave all the other settings and click Run. You now have a feature class made up of parcels that only fall within the unclassified zones. Take a moment to clean up the contents pane. Remove the U zone and rural parcel layers. You won't need them for the rest of the analysis. Performing a spatial query. You have now satisfied the second criterion. The next step is to locate properties that are next to roads. From the Project Geo database, add the road feature class to the map. Okay, this color is terrible, so I'm just going to change it so that I can see what I'm doing. Find the Select by Location tool on the map ribbon and launch the tool. For the input feature, choose the Rural U layer. Next, define the relationship. You want to select features from the Rural U layer that are within a certain distance from the roads. Use the drop-down menu and choose Within a Distance as the Relationship. Under Selecting Features, 
use the drop down menu and choose the roads. Under search distance, type in 10 and make sure that the units are set to meters. Be sure that the selection type is set to new selection. When ready, click OK. I'm going to zoom in closer so that you can see the results. As you can see, only the properties next to roads are selected. In the catalog pane, right click on the Rural U layer and export it as a feature class. Name it Rural U Selection without spaces. Take a moment to clear your selection, then remove the roads and the Rural U layer. You won't need them for the rest of the analysis. Skill Drill. Spatial Query. I have satisfied the third criterion. In the next step, I'm going to narrow down the range of properties further by using a spatial selection to find the properties that have no rivers crossing them. From the Project Geodatabase, add the Rivers feature class to the map. I'll go ahead and change the color to blue since it represents a water feature. Using the skills you just learned, perform a spatial query. Select the properties that intersect the rivers. Make sure that the relationship is set to intersect. This means that any properties that touch any features on the river layer will get selected. You might be thinking that properties that touch rivers are exactly the opposite of what I want. The criteria asks for properties that don't have rivers crossing them. To fix this problem, you'll need to invert the spatial relationship by checking the box. This will change it so that the properties that don't intersect the rivers get selected. Go ahead and run the tool. I'm going to zoom in close to check the results. As you can see, properties that don't have rivers crossing them are the ones that were selected. Export the layer as a feature class. Name it River Parcels with no spaces. Take a moment to clear the selected features and remove the Rural U selection layer from the map. You can also remove the rivers as well. Performing a clip operation. I have satisfied the fourth criterion. Now I want to locate properties that are at least 600 meters away from wetland areas. To do this, I will start by clipping the wetlands layer to the Humboldt County boundary. Then I'll create a 600 meter buffer around the wetlands. Finally, I'll use the wetlands buffer to erase these unwanted areas from the properties. Take a moment to save your project before moving on to the next step. You're going to clip the wetlands layer, which is a very large file. Sometimes this can cause Arc Pro to crash. To help prevent crashes, you won't be adding the wetlands layer to the map. Instead, you'll use the clip tool in advance. On the analysis ribbon, locate the tools group. This is a collection of frequently used tools. Click pairwise clip. For the input features, Click the yellow file folder icon and browse to your project geodatabase. Choose the wetlands feature class. For the clip feature, use the drop down menu and choose the Humboldt County layer. Name the output wetlands clip with no spaces in the name. When you're ready, click run. The wetlands clip layer should get added to the map automatically. As you can see, the wetlands are clipped to the shape of the Humboldt County boundary. Creating a buffer. Now that the wetlands are clipped, the next step is to create a 600 meter buffer. Click 
pairwise buffer in the tools group on the analysis ribbon. For the input feature, choose the wetlands clip. Name the output wetland buffer with no spaces in the name. For the distance value, enter 600. Make sure the units are set to meters. For our purposes here, we don't want individual buffers around the rivers. We want one large buffer feature. To do this, choose Dissolve All Output Features into a single feature under the Dissolve type. Leave all the other settings and run the tool. The wetlands buffer gets added to the map. Take a moment to remove the wetlands clip layer. You won't be needing it for the rest of the analysis. Performing an erase operation. For the next step, we want to remove all of the areas that fall within the wetland buffer. I'll zoom in closer so you can see what I mean. Here we want to keep only the land that falls outside the buffer zone. To do this, you'll be using the Erase tool, which works like the inverse of a clip operation. Click the Tools button on the Analysis tab. Type in Erase in the search box and open the tool. For the Input feature, choose the River Parcels. For the Erase feature, choose the Wetland Buffer. You can leave the output name as River Parcels Erase. When you're ready, run the tool. To see the results, remove the buffer layer and the river parcel layer. As you can see, the erase tool used the shape of the buffer to erase unwanted land from the river parcel layer. Skill drill, attribute query. The next criterion in our analysis is properties that have an area of greater than 70,000 square meters. To start, you'll need to make sure that all of the areas are updated. Open the attribute table for the river parcel erase layer. Right click on the area field and choose calculate geometry. Under property, Choose Area. Under Area Unit, choose Square Meters. Leave all the other settings and click OK. The attribute table is now updated so that the area field is in square meters. Using the skills you previously learned, perform an attribute query to select areas that are greater than 70,000 square meters. When you are done, export the layer as a feature class. Call it Erase Selection with no spaces in the name. Clear your selection and remove the River Parcel Erase layer from the contents pane. What you now have are parcels of land that meet the size requirements. Compound SQL statements. Let's review our progress so far. We have properties that are rural residential and zoned as unclassified. The remaining properties are close to roads and have no rivers crossing them. They are also at least 600 meters away from wetlands areas. All of the remaining properties have an area of at least 70,000 square meters. The last step is to choose parcels that are close to a cell tower with a strong signal. To do this, we need to create buffers around the cell towers that represent the areas with a strong signal. From the Project Geo database, add the cell tower feature class to the map. Open the attribute table for the cell towers. The first step is to add a field that will hold the distance values representing a strong signal. We'll use these values to create a variable distance buffer. On the attribute table, 
click the Add button. Name the field Buffer. I accidentally added another field. That's fine, I'll delete it later. The buffer field will only hold whole numbers, so for the data type, it's okay to leave it as long, which stands for long integer. Close the Add Field tab and save your edits. If you accidentally created an extra field like I did, you can right click on it and delete it. Next, we're going to initialize this field so that all of the values are zero. I find that doing this before moving on to the next step helps to avoid bugs in the software. Okay, so let's look at the table in the written instructions. This table shows the buffer values that need to be assigned to each cell tower. These buffers represent the stable signal range of those towers. Okay, so our first group of towers have a range of 400 meters. These towers are 7, 8, 21, and 25. To populate the buffer field in the attribute table, there are two steps. First, you have to select the cell towers you want. Then, with the cell tower selected, you run the field calculator. Let's start with an attribute query. Click the Select by Attributes button. Make sure the selection type is set to New Selection. Then start the expression where location number is equal to 7. Click the plus sign to add a clause. The next clause will be or location number is equal to 8. I'm using the or here because it's easier in this situation. OK, add another clause that begins with or. Or location number is equal to 21. Add another clause. Or location number is equal to 25. OK, it looks good, so I'm going to click OK. Now when I look at the attribute table, I can see that the cell towers 7, 8, 21, and 25 are selected. The next step is the Calculate field. To do that, right-click on the name Buffer and choose Calculate field. This part is really easy. All you need to do is enter the number 400 in the box after the equal sign and click OK. Whenever you have a record selected, the Calculate field tool will only work on those records. You can see here that only the rows that were selected got updated. Before moving on to the next step, clear your selection. The next group of cell towers are a little more complicated because there are a range of values. We have cell towers 5 and 6, 9 through 12, 14, 18, 22, 26, and 27. Go ahead and open the Select by Attributes tool. Clear out your old queries. We want to start with location number is equal to 5. Add a clause and enter or location number is equal to 6. Add a clause and enter or location number is greater than or equal to nine. Here we are starting a compound statement because we want a range of values, cell towers nine through 12. So using greater than or equal to nine, signals the start of the range. Go ahead and add a clause. For this one, you'll need to use the AND operator because you're going to combine this clause with the previous one. Enter AND location number is less than or equal to 12.
go ahead and add a clause. Start the next one with an OR operator, which signals a new condition that is not part of the previous one. OR location number is equal to 14. Add a clause and enter OR location number is equal to 18. Add a clause and enter OR location number is equal to 22. Add a clause and enter OR location number is equal to 26. And the last one is OR location number is equal to 27. Okay, so let's try it out. I'm going to make sure the correct records were selected. I can see 5, 6, and then I can see that 9 through 12 were selected. 14, 18, 22, 26, and 27. Okay, run the calculate field and set these to 1000. As you can see, only the selected records were updated with 1000. When you're done, clear your selection. Skill drill, attribute query. Okay, now it's time to practice what you've learned. The next group of cell towers needs to have a buffer distance of 5,500. There is a small range at the beginning, cell towers one, two, and three and the rest are individual cell towers, 15, 17, 19, 20, and 23. Use the Select by Attributes button to construct an attribute query that includes this group of cell towers. If you get stuck using the AND operator to create a compound expression, then just keep it simple and add each cell tower one at a time using the OR operator. Whatever works for you. Once all the cell towers are selected, run the Calculate Field tool and set the value to 5,500. You'll need to repeat these steps for the last group of cell towers, which will need a buffer distance of 8,000. When you're done, all of the cell towers should have the correct value in the buffer field. Be sure to save your project before moving on to the next step. Creating a Variable Distance Buffer To determine which parcels of land have a strong cell signal, you will need to create a variable distance buffer representing a strong signal strength. A variable distance buffer is one that has different buffer distances from the point of origin. Any parcels of land that fall within the buffer will be among the final candidates for the music festival location. Click Pairwise Buffer in the Tools group on the Analysis ribbon. For the input feature, choose the cell tower layer. Name the output cell tower buffer with no spaces in the name. Use the drop down menu to set the distance to field. Below that, choose the buffer field as the distance value. You don't need to dissolve the buffers this time, so leave all the remaining settings and run the tool. The results will be different size buffers around each cell tower. Skill Drill, Spatial Query. Now you are ready for the last step in the analysis. Using the skills you learned previously, perform a spatial query using the Select by Location tool. You want to select any parcels of land that are completely within the cell tower buffer. Once you have these parcels selected, export it to your Geo database as a feature class. Name the output Final Candidates with no spaces in the name. Take a moment to clear your selection. Remove all of the layers except the Final Candidates and the Humboldt County boundary. In the next step, I'll show you how to create and export a map. Creating a locator map. 
In this step, I will show you how to create a custom map size 6 by 6 inches. You'll be using this small size to create three maps for a lab report, one locator map and two site maps. It's always important to make sure that the map layout is the exact size and shape you plan to use. For example, many people will use one of the default sizes, such as 8.5 by 11 inches. Unless you plan to use the map at this size, it's a really bad habit to accept these layout defaults when designing your map. So for example, if you needed a small six by six inch map for a report and design the map using a layout of eight and a half by 11 inches, you would have to shrink the map down after the fact. This makes your map hard to read. If you need a six by six inch map, Design your map using a 6 by 6 inch layout. The point is to avoid resizing your map image later. On the Insert ribbon, click the New Layout button. Move your mouse cursor to the bottom to scroll down until you see the Custom Page Size option. Change the dimensions so that the height and width are both 6 inches. What you see here is the page size. In the next step, you'll need to add a map frame to the page. Click the map frame button on the maps frame group. Select the map with the final candidates. Next, drag a rectangle to represent where to place the map frame on the page. It doesn't have to be perfect. We'll adjust the size and position of the map frame in a later step. Click the Map Frame ribbon. On the right, adjust the size and position of the map frame on the page. You'll need to set the X and Y values to zero. You can also adjust the width and the height of the map frame so that it matches the page size, six by six inches. To adjust the map scale and the contents of the map frame, go to the Layout ribbon. Click the button that says Activate. When you activate a map frame, it allows you to pan and zoom within the map. As I mentioned earlier, you'll be creating three map layouts. For the locator map, you should zoom far out enough to see the position of the final candidates in relation to Humboldt County. For the site map, you'll need to zoom in close so that the final candidates are clearly visible. I'm going to start with the locator map since I think it will be the easiest to create. Adjust the scale and the map extent to show the location of the final candidates in relation to Humboldt County. Once you're satisfied with the scale and the extent of the map features, lock the position by deactivating the map frame. You can do this on the layout ribbon by clicking on Close Activation. To avoid confusion, rename this layout. In the catalog pane, expand the Layouts folder and rename this layout Locator. Next, you'll add a rectangle around the final candidates to serve as an extent indicator. On the Insert ribbon, locate the Graphic and Text group and open the tools available. Use the Rectangle tool in the Polygon group and draw a rectangle around the final parcels. To change the color and line width, double click on the rectangle in the contents pane. This will open the elements pane, which has a symbology tab. Change the color so that it contrasts with the background layers. You can also adjust the line width. Next, you'll add another rectangle to serve as the background for your map elements. This is especially useful if your background layers are complex or if you're using an image. Just click and drag to create a rectangle along the bottom. You can edit the elements to adjust the size and position to make sure it lands exactly where you want. You can also change the color as well. I'll insert a north arrow and adjust the size. 
you want to make sure that your north arrow is small and inconspicuous. I'll also add a scale bar. When you add a scale bar, make sure to adjust the size so that the units make sense and are easy to use. I'm just going to drag this one out so that it is exactly 10 miles. I'll also add a legend. Never use the word legend as a legend title. Either provide a descriptive legend title or leave it out. In this instance, no legend title is necessary. I will only need to show the final candidate layer, so I'm going to uncheck the Humble County background under the legend items. Next, I'll reposition the legend so that it aligns with other map elements. Notice that the legend label uses the layer name, which shows the final candidates as one word. While removing spaces is necessary for the file name, it's not appropriate for a legend label. To fix this, I'm going to change the layer name and the properties. Just retype the name in the General tab and click OK. As you can see, the legend automatically updates. Now for some final touches. Earlier I mentioned background imagery. The project data includes a Landsat image. If you want, you can use the Landsat image as a background instead of the Humboldt County boundary. If you use the Landsat image, make sure that the colors of the final parcels contrast with the background. For example, this pink color is hard to see. I'm not entirely satisfied with the quality of this image, so I'm going to go with the Humboldt County boundary as my base map layer. I'm also going to change the frame background color to blue so that it mimics the water features on the map. Once you are satisfied with your map layout, export it as a PNG. Just right click on the locator layout in the catalog pane and choose export to file. Make sure the file type is set to PNG. Also make sure the resolution is set to 300 DPI. Save the file to your final folder. When you're ready, click export. Skill drill, creating a site map. Using the skills you just learned, create another map layout. This one will be for your site map. As a shortcut, you can make a copy of your locator layout. Just remember to change the name. Also, delete the extent indicator rectangle and change the map scale and extent. Remember, you'll need to activate the map frame to change the scale. If you want to add an image as the background for your sitemap, the Landsat image is a bit blurry. A good choice for high resolution images is the NAEP aerial photographs, available from the USGS Earth Explorer. You'll find a link to the Earth Explorer website in the written instructions. This tutorial assumes that you have some experience downloading NAEP images from the Earth Explorer website so there aren't any detailed instructions. Basically, you'll need to log into the site. Then place markers close to where you think the final candidates are located. In this instance, there are two regions of interest. Once you have the markers in place, switch to the Datasets tab and check the box next to NAEP. After you click the Results button, you'll get a list of NAEP images. Just click the footprint to get a sense of where each image lands on the map. Once you have the images that cover your area of interest, click the download button next to each image. 
you'll probably need to copy them from your downloads folder to your original folder and decompress the zip files. Don't forget to refresh your original folder in ArcGIS Pro. Okay, so I have downloaded some NAPE images from the USGS Earth Explorer. They are too small to cover the entire area, so I'll create two sitemaps. For the first one, I'll zoom in to this parcel to the north. Notice as I zoom in and out, the scale bar automatically changes. I'm just going to zoom out so that the scale bar is half a mile long. Once you're satisfied with the position and scale, close the activation to lock it in place. I also noticed that the nape images are showing up in the legend. I don't want that, so I'm going to uncheck them under the legend in the contents pane. Next, I'll create a second sitemap for the group of parcels to the south. As before, just make a copy of your layout and give it a different name. To change the scale and extent, activate the map frame. Reposition the map and keep an eye on the scale bar to make sure that the units still make sense. This one will be half a mile long as well. Once you're done, you can deactivate the map frame and lock it in place. When you're ready, export both of your sitemaps as PNG files and save them to your final folder. If you enjoyed this demonstration of the musical destination tutorial, like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.